I'm going to be talking about the importance of heterogeneity. Uh, I am uh, uh, the proud awardee of the ninth uh, uh, PSIPW prize in groundwater. And uh, I have been working on groundwater uh, for the last uh, 35 years. And uh, one of my main uh, interests is uh, in how to characterize heterogeneity uh, of the underground. I will be talking about heterogeneity, and, um, and even though we all understand that uh, in the subsurface, the materials uh, vary in a space uh, in a more or less uh, heterogeneous way, we, we may not have an exact idea of, of what uh, we mean by that. I mean, which type of heterogeneity are we talking about? It is, uh, in general, not possible to see what's uh, in the aquifer, I mean, uh, what is uh, underground. I mean, we can drill wells and see a little bit what's, uh, uh, what's uh, beneath the surface, but uh, in general, we don't see the, uh, what, what, what an aquifer may look like, except for some cases, like uh, when we have access uh, to an open pit mine. In this case, this is uh, the Hunter Valley Coal Open Pit Mine. It's a picture taken there. For reference, uh, there is a crane here that may be uh, 10 meters high. Uh, you can also see the trees uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, so this section could be maybe, I don't know, 100 meters uh, uh, thickness. And, and, and here we can see actually what uh, the underground looks like, what is beneath uh, the surface. And we can see that there is uh, um, there are many materials uh, that you can uh, differentiate uh, by the colors uh, of uh, in the picture and you can see there is some layering I mean this is a sedimentary basin so there is uh, a variability in the vertical direction but there is also variability in the horizontal direction so there is uh, there is this uh, heterogeneity these this changes that uh, uh, ex exist um, underground but, but as I said, in general, we don't have access to this uh, information. We don't have an access to this picture of, the, of, of our aquifer. The most we may have is a couple of wells. Okay, the most we may have is just information about uh, the distribution of the different materials at uh, a couple of locations, a few wells uh, uh, in the aquifer. And, uh, and we are going to be seeing only what you see in these uh, small slits. And from that, we should be able uh, to reconstruct the heterogeneity that is beneath uh, the surface. Because if we don't account for this heterogeneity properly, as I will show you next, we can make, uh, it is very possible that we will make predictions that are not uh, accurate, that are not, uh, are not good. I mean, we're going to make an analysis of how the aquifer may behave that it will be wrong. Sometimes, besides this couple of wells, we may have some seismic information, some geophysical information, like a, a seismic survey. And in this case, uh, I'm showing you what could be, say, the result of, uh, of, uh, of this seismic survey. And, uh, and what you see here is a normalized impedance. And you can relate this impedance with uh, some of the parameters that uh, will uh, describe the aquifer. Uh, in general, it's, it's more related to the porosity or to the water content. Uh, uh, that's uh, what you can uh, relate this information to. So you, we have very limited direct information, a direct vision of what's underneath through the wells, and some approximate information of what may look like the heterogeneity through uh, some uh, uh, secondary geophysical information when we have access uh, to it. But again, at the end, what I want to do is uh, to model this heterogeneity from that limited information. Because, as I say, if we don't model this information, we don't model this heterogeneity, we may uh, end up with uh, poor predictions of uh, our models. And I'm going to show you a few examples, yes, uh, to show you the impact of accounting for the heterogeneity uh, in, uh, in the modeling of the aquifer. The first example is uh, is just uh, imagine we have a release of uh, of some uh, contaminant, some some solute in the aquifer. Uh, water is flowing from from left to right, and uh, we have four different uh, aquifers with uh, uh, four different uh, representations of heterogeneity. On the top, we have uh, say the 
easy uh, model, the one which is homogeneous, the one which is still uh, uh, being applied very much uh, uh, today. And then we have three more aquifers with increased uh, uh, amount of heterogeneity, which is measured by uh, the variance of the, uh, the log conductivity. So let's see how this, uh, this uh, solute behaves when we dump it in the aquifer, uh, depending on the heterogeneity of the aquifer. You can see that uh, uh, in the homogeneous one, basically the, the dump moves uh, like a blob, I mean like a compact, uh, uh, compact mass of contamination, whereas uh, as soon as we have a uh, heterogeneity, this plume uh, will change in shapes. I mean, it will uh, elongate uh, depending on where is the located the areas of highest conductivity, and some of the mass will be retarded because uh, it will be trapped in the areas of uh, low conductivity. So you can imagine that. Uh, I mean, if the reality is uh, like any of the heterogeneous uh, uh, aquifers that you see here the predictions that you are going to be making when you use uh, a homogeneous uh, aquifer are going to be very, very far-fetched from uh, reality. And some may say, well, but I mean, generally um, uh, in, in groundwater um, transport, uh, flow and transport, I mean, there is also a dispersion, dispersion induced by the, the variability of the velocity of the water under, underneath. And here you haven't accounted for that. Okay, let's see in another example, I mean, what happens if we put this uh, dispersion, this uh, macro dispersion as its, uh, as its model? And in the left, it will be just a, a simulation of uh, the movement of the, of the solute in the aquifer. And in the right will be an equivalent uh, homogeneous aquifer with some uh, macro dispersion to try to mimic uh, this uh, uh, variability, this, this elongation of the plume that uh, we observed uh, in the previous uh, picture. And, uh, and this is what will happen. I mean, uh, yes, the macro dispersion model uh, elongates uh, the, the plume in the homogeneous case, um, but still, I mean, the image, the, the understanding, the representation of uh, how the solute behaves in a homogeneous uh, aquifer, even including this, uh, uh, this macro dispersion, is very far from uh, the actual movement of the plume in the heterogeneous aquifers. And we can see that, I mean, the more heterogeneous the aquifer is, the more dispersion, I mean, the more variability, the more uh, dispersion, both lateral and uh, longitudinal, uh, there is on the on the final plume, and the plume just breaks apart into the smaller uh, subplumes that uh, will never be captured if we do uh, a modeling of a homogeneous aquifer. One final example: uh, imagine that uh, there is an area that has been polluted. In this case, it's a, it's a fictitious square area that has been polluted. Uh, on the left, we have an, a, a heterogeneous aquifer. On the right, we have a homogeneous aquifer. If we try to clean it, and we just put uh, use a, a pump and treat approach in which we will be pumping out the water that has been contaminated uh, in the aquifer, uh, this is what uh, will happen when we start pumping. We see that in the homogeneous aquifer, everything basically moves very smoothly towards the pumping well, which is uh, at the center. Whereas in the heterogeneous aquifer, because of this heterogeneity, which implies areas of low velocities and areas of high velocities of water, well, everything is much more uh, intricate, is much more complicated. Water doesn't flow so easily to towards uh, the aquifer, and therefore the solute is not uh, uh, extracted, is not uh, taken out uh, uh, so easily. In the homogeneous case, apparently, I mean, you will be able to clean up the aquifer in a relatively short uh, uh, time without uh, any problem. And, and this and this result is the reason why many pump and treat uh, approaches fail because uh, they did the the modeling, they did the an analysis of how the pump and treat will work using homogeneous aquifers when the reality is, uh, is quite different. Inverse modeling is uh, a way to try to mm, get back, try to track back, which is the heterogeneity of uh, our aquifers. And uh, this is what we have been working uh, uh, for the last uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. 
uh, in our group, and, and this is uh, also mm, uh, the reason why I got uh, the award uh, this year. Um, by inverse modeling, basically what we are going to be doing, what we, we try to do is to gather information from the state of the system and in an aquifer we are talking about hydraulic heads and uh, or concentrations of the solutes and with that information which generally is easier to obtain that uh, measuring hydraulic conductivities then we will try to infer the uh, spatial distribution of uh, our parameter I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate you uh, this inverse modeling in a forensic hydrogeology uh, case, which is the uh, identification of a contaminant source. So we are go going to be trying to get both the characterization of the structure of the aquifer, of the heterogeneity of the aquifer, and also identify where a contaminant was placed in the aquifer and when that happened. So the data we will be using to do to perform this exercise will be concentration breakthrough curves at some sampling locations so in an aquifer that I'll show you next. We'll put, put some observation locations. We will see how the uh, solute gets through those locations. And with only that information, so several uh, breakthrough curves at different locations in the aquifer, we are going to be able to retrieve back the heterogeneity of the aquifer and also the location, uh, the strength and the duration of uh, a point contamination, a point uh, continuous contamination. We did this with a laboratory experiment and uh, we basically in, uh, in, in the lab we built, we built uh, a synthetic aquifer. Uh, you can see here how they were putting together uh, two different types of materials. In this case, they were glass beads of uh, different diameters uh, and at the end they built this uh, heterogeneous uh, sandbox with, uh, you can see there, two types of materials. The darker one is the most conductive and the uh, lighter one is the uh, less conductive. They are the smallest uh, uh, sphere bits. A close-up of that, uh, uh, of that uh, sandbox, you can see it here. And uh, the heterogeneity uh, in this case, I mean, is, is not what we saw in the, in the open pit mine, but it's clear that there is heterogeneity uh, in the dark uh, uh, spot that you see there is where we will be injecting uh, the solute. And this solute is clearly that is going to be displaced uh, initially through the high uh, conductivity area, which is this darker area. And then it will have to move. Uh, I mean, the water flows from left to right. I mean, I'm sorry, from right to left. And, uh, and then it will look its way uh, to the exit point, which is uh, on the right side of this, uh, of this sandbox. Um, a schematic view of the, of the sandbox, uh, we have uh, basically a, a constant stream, I mean, constant hydraulic head on the right uh, border of the, of the sandbox and uh, uh, another constant uh, hydraulic head on the left border of the sandbox. So the water goes from right to left and uh, the values are, uh, well, I, I didn't put them, I mean, uh, this HU and uh, HD. And uh, the size of the sidebox, as you see there, is <coughs> about 95 centimeters uh, in width and 70 uh, centimeters uh, on height. E at the location of the red uh, uh, triangle, we will place uh, the injection and then uh, we will uh, observe the breakthrough curves at the mm, dots, at the black dots that you see on the figure. And from that information, from the breakthrough curve at those uh, uh, observation points, we will be able to retrieve both the, the architecture <coughs> of the sandbox and also the location where the uh, release happened, the time when it started, when it ended, and uh, uh, the strength of the, of the injection. We use a uh, fluor sim, and uh, on the other side of the of the sandbox, so there is there is a dark room with a camera, uh, so that when we inject uh, this uh, fluor sim and uh, and we um, uh, excite it with this uh, blue light uh, neon, then what happens is the the fluor sim gets just uh, fluorescent, and uh, uh, the amount uh, of uh, uh, the color that you get back uh, will depend on the concentration of the of the fluor sim. This is an, an example. This is one of the pictures that uh, 
uh, will be taken from uh, from this dark box uh, with the injection point uh, as as I mentioned and uh, and you see uh, this uh, yellowish greenish uh, uh, fluorescing uh, being captured by the by the picture again the intensity of the of the of the color is calibrated and uh, uh, we can retrieve from this picture on the basis of the of the intensity of the color the concentration of the uh, fluorescein at any location uh, and as i said we are trying to mimic a case in which we have these 25 observation points and we are looking at the breakthrough curves at those 25 uh, observation locations the experiment that we carried was uh, uh, the injection of this uh, fluorescein at uh, 20 milligrams per liter during, during uh, 1200 seconds uh, we took uh, those 25 black dots uh, observations every 30 seconds until 3000 seconds and um, uh, there were 25 observation points and the inversion approach the inversion uh, inversion modeling uh, that uh, we use was this ensemble camel filter um, and I show you how I mean the results that the ensemble camel filter uh, produces the ensemble camel filter is an assimilation uh, uh, filter it's an assimilation approach so what happens is that we take every 30 seconds one snapshot I mean uh, values at the 25 locations of the concentration and with those values we will uh, try to estimate the parameters uh, uh, of uh, the model basically the heterogeneity of the conductivity and uh, the source characteristics the ensemble camel filter is like if you are running in parallel uh, you have a model uh, a numerical conceptual model that you have built and then you have your observations so in every 30 seconds you you stop you take the observations you compare the observations with the predictions of the model and then you correct your model depending on how well uh, you are making the predictions okay so these are the results that you get i mean the uh, the final estimation of the conductivity uh, that uh, we obtain uh, <clears throat> which is made in, in a very fine grid i mean as you can see there i mean we're es making estimates of the conductivity uh, at uh, in a very fine uh, distribution of the of the sandbox well basically it's capturing this uh, this structure of the of the high values and and of the low uh, values of uh, of conductivity um, it's clear that uh, we are not getting back exactly this uh, this binary uh, heterogeneity that uh, is actually in the sandbox but it's clear that we are capturing the heterogeneity and uh, we are also able for instance to identify the coordinates of the release uh, as i mentioned what you have here is uh, the estimate of the x and z uh, coordinates of the release uh, as a function of time and uh, because of the way the ensemble camera filter works you, what you have is actually as a, as a band of estimates is, is, is a range of estimates that is given by these box plots with the red line being the mean value the best estimate of the of the location and we can see that both for the x and the z value we are getting almost exactly back the uh, position where the injection happened the same uh, we did it for the initial time the, the final time the release uh, uh, amount in uh, obtaining good, op good good values after some time steps after some of this uh, updating of the model uh, every 30 seconds um, with the parameters that we obtain I mean, with the location that we obtain I mean we identify and with this structure of the of the conductivities that we identify then we try to make a prediction of how the plume will behave and uh, the truth is that the results are, are very satisfying i mean this is the true plume i mean as observed in the uh, in the pictures that we took in the dark room and uh, this uh, is the estimated plume obtained with the uh, model built uh, using uh, the uh, estimation uh, given by uh, this inversion method this uh, ensemble, ensemble camel uh, filter let me show you again i mean this is the true plume and this is the estimated plume at uh, a different times okay at 10 40 60 and 90 seconds since the beginning of uh, the injection so i will conclude that uh, heterogeneity as i have shown you plays a crucial role in the fate and transport of solids in groundwater it has to be properly accounted for if we want to make predictions that make sense improper modeling will result in an improper remediation strategy and uh, 
the tools that uh, we have right now that will allow us to uh, capture this heterogeneity, some of these tools are these inverse models that uh, will allow us to improve the characterization of the sub subsurface, making use of easy to gather information, such as could be uh, piezometric heads or concentration at uh, observation locations. That's all. Thank you very much.